Food has always been an aggregate for bringing people together. In ancient times, it was for the sake of survival. But in modern times, it's also for holiday occasions and or romantic dinners with couples. It's a bonding agent that makes for your wit more interactive and engaging. It's also what makes the Holy Trinity if you want to have a good time, that of food, fun, and females. I don't got food or Wi-Fi yet, though. See you, bro. Now we all have our favorite foods to coalesce around, but there is one fun and delectable dish I think best serves this purpose. Fondue. Already, cliche tropes come to mind, Switzerland and 1970s suburbia. But why though? Why do we attach these themes to this pot of melted cheese? Well, let me tell you, after my research, there's a lot more to this dish than comes to mind. It's a story of humble beginnings, indoctrination, greed, and power-hungry forces. Tags I never expect come out of this dish. So with that in mind, allow me to present to you the delectable, the scandalous, and unabridged history of fondue. The word fondue is a French verb meaning to melt. It's a fair position that leads many to claim it originated in France, but some would also say Italy, as their verb to melt is similarly spelled fonduta. But let's not get too far into hypothetical linguistic origins. What about document sources? What is the earliest document referring to melting cheese in a pot? The answer to that question comes not from the Swiss Alps, nor the writings of a chef, but from a much older piece of literacy. The Iliad. Yes, the earliest record of melting cheese comes from Greek Homer's Iliad around the 8th century BC. In Book 11 of the Iliad, Hecamede, concubine of King Nestor, serves refreshments to his guests. Quote, First she drew up a finely polished table with blue enameled feet. Beside it, she set up an ornate vessel Nestor had brought from Greece. In this vessel, Hecamede, lovely as a goddess, mix Promian wine, then grated into its goat milk cheese using a bronze grater, and sprinkled its surface with white barley meal. When all was ready, she urged them to drink." End quote. Quite the origin story, but it's not the full picture. The gap between 800 BC and when Switzerland was conceived is too obvious. So let's fast forward to the near 17th century. According to legend, the Swiss peasants invented fondue using aged cheese and stale bread to feed themselves during the winter months. This could explain why Gruyere cheese is the go-to for fondue, as it's usually aged to as much as a year before selling it. But, as I said, it's a legend, a romantic folktale, that possibly isn't the official origin of fondue. Fast forward to 1699. A recipe is published in Zurich, named Kespet Wein wird kochen, to cook cheese with wine by Anna Margaretha Gesserin. The recipe required half a glass of wine, thinly cut aged cheese, and dark bread to dip in, likely rye bread, making this the earliest recipe for modern fondue. But that wasn't the type of fondue people widely accepted at that time. So we must look deeper. What classified as fondue? The clearest answer comes from the 19th century French lawyer and gastronomic theorist, Brilliant Savarin. In his book, the physiology of taste, he describes it as such, quote, Fondue is a soup dish and consists only in frying eggs in cheese in proportions revealed by experience, end quote. Accompanying it was a fondue recipe, which required eggs, butter, and gruyere served with good wine. The eggs in this recipe was the cornerstone to making fondue at that time. See, traditional fondues today required agent to bind the cheese and wine, specifically cornstarch. But before then, people had to make do with egg. In other words, fondue before cornstarch was what we call today scrambled eggs. So for two centuries, this <coughs> fondue would be eaten in the Swiss Alps and neighboring regions. It wouldn't be until the 1870s that fondue that's known today was being made predominantly by the nobility. And finally, the introduction of Mazzina in 1905, a sort of cornflour, would replace the need for eggs altogether. So what started off as scrambled eggs for the peasants had eventually turned into the modern fondue we know today, 
thanks to the introduction of cornstarch and those with means. As conclusive as this sounds, fondue wasn't a mainstream dish. It was eaten occasionally by the French upper middle class in French-speaking regions of Switzerland, but nothing else. That would all change in the early 20th century, thanks to the meddling of a special elite who would fabricate our modern conception of fondue that continues to this very day. In the bloody years of the First World War, millions were affected, who were now just scraping by. Neutral Switzerland was an exception. It seemed it wouldn't face the hardship like their neighboring countries, but the war put them in a different kind of hardship. Since the 17th century, Switzerland's primary industry was exporting cheese, but now, with no customers to sell to, had to rely on selling cheese within their own country. Added the decrease in fodder to feed their cattle, it resulted in slashing prices to clear excess stock and the loss of vital resources. Switzerland was now on the verge of economic jeopardy, but a remedy was introduced. The Schweizer Käse Union, or the Swiss Cheese Union. This was a cartel created by the most prominent cheese producers to protect the national food supply, but also to secure their profits. According to the proceedings of the Third International Conference of Agricultural Economics says, quote, When the war broke out, agriculture made peace with the cheese trade, and to this, the milk associations, as well as the cheese trade, belong. The whole of the cheese trade, including the export business, is thus concentrated under one control. The cheese union, each spring and autumn, when the cheese producers bought the milk, guaranteed the prices of the cheese made from it." End quote. In short, the Swiss Cheese Union fixed the prices of the milk and cheese and dictated the quantity both parties can produce their product, a scheme to keep prices high and competition low. This bureaucratic arrangement even resulted in narrowing the types of cheeses producers can make. But, more not later, their control would soon seep into the Swiss government. At the start of the Great Depression, plummeting prices threatened to topple the Union's cheese empire. And so, the government came in to subsidize it, originally temporarily, but soon indefinitely. During the interwar period, the Union has fully consolidated their grasp on the cheese industry, and with the help of government subsidies rolling in, they resumed to selling their products out of the country. But the cheese union was not content. People were not eating cheese by the wheel. In other words, they still had an excess stock of cheese. So they wondered, how can we sell cheese in bulk to minimize surplus? See, fondue wasn't something people ate much. Those regions most familiar with fondue would normally eat it a few times out of the year on holidays. All that would change under the Swiss Cheese Union. With the help of their advertisement team, though I think advertising is an understatement, they excelled this irrelevant dish to national stardom that would completely bewitch the populace with an infectious enthusiasm for fondue. Posters began popping up with depictions of rain or snow as fondue weather reinforcing a notion that fondue delivers warmth and comfort to guests. Recipes for preparing fondue for any occasion and for any number of guests were distributed, and iconography of good Swiss people shoveling fondue at each other encouraged audiences to do the same. The Union even used images of the character Heidi, an iconic Swiss kid's story told and translated worldwide, to solicit fondue to the youth, all with the same selling point. Fondue is good and creates a good mood. It became a part of every family occasion to congregate around the Cagalon, and a standard at ski resorts to sell warm batches of fondue after a long day on the slopes. Ultimately, the marketing worked. But why stop there? With the political establishment in their pocket, the Swiss Cheese Union turned fondue into a national dish with the zeal akin to nationalism. No, cheese nationalism. Swiss soldiers were given fondue kits during their service, so that when they return home, they could teach it to their children, tying it with Swiss patriotism. And fondue recipes were arbitrarily installed to represent each region's identity. In Vaudoise, it was Gruyere. Neuchâtel, it was your traditional Gruyere and Emmental. In Appelzemmer, it was your Appelzemmer cheese and cream. 
all to defend the national spirit of the fatherland. This cheese nationalism, backed by the population, allowed for rituals and semi-mythical stories to fabricate around fondue. When joined fondue respectively with others, here are some rules to keep in mind. 1. Do not eat fondue alone. Fondue is a communal dish, used to create solidarity with others, so always enjoy it with two or more comrades. 2. Dip and stir your bread in a figure eight. This allows the party to contribute to stirring the pot. 3. It's advised that you use tough bread with crust to avoid sogging. Alternatives for dipping can include potatoes, mushrooms, baked fennel, or broccoli. 4. Please, for the love of God, skew above the pot to prevent it from being wasted onto the floor. 5. Crime and Punishment Whoever loses their bread in the pot has to choose one of the following. Kiss someone, be careful to do COVID. Sing a song, run naked in the snow, or buy the next cheese wheel. Fair deal, right? And lastly, it's recommended you don't drink water with fondue. This is because, allegedly, the water will cause the bread in your system to swell, preventing you from eating more and buying more cheese. Instead, it's best served with dry white wine from your respected region. And as rituals took hold, so did abridged mythical stories on fondue's history were implanted. Fondue has been the backbone of the population's diet for generations. It represents the hospitality of the nation and the commutative spirit of its citizens. So you could say they skewed the narrative. <laughs> it was a story so easily sold to the foreign markets. And now that they had the population on their side, the Union set their hungry eyes on new ventures. By the 1960s, the Union propagated their golden child to their number one consumer, the United States. It was at the controversial New York World's Fair of 1964 that fondue was featured at the Swiss Pavilion Alpine Restaurant, and by the 70s, it became a suburban dining phenomenon. See, American suburban parties in the 70s were an avant-garde show for food. It showed that left the audience cringed more than hungry. Never before have I seen a spread use so much gelatin and items that should just shouldn't be mixed. But fondue, I would say, saved the day. The suburbians have heard legends of this simple yet delectable dish from the Alps, and now they can finally enjoy this dish in the comfort of their suburban homes. As a fun tidbit, officially, the fondue family would be introduced to chocolate fondue by chef Conrad Egil out of his restaurant in Manhattan. Instead of the typical cheese, he replaced it with a newly selling Swiss chocolate bar. Surprisingly, Conrad's magnum opus wasn't on behalf of the Swiss Cheese Union, but on behalf of sponsoring an upcoming Swiss chocolate company to sell their latest brand, Trobolone. On the contrary, as early as the 30s, America was no exception to the Cheese Union's propaganda. From their American base in New York, the Swiss Cheese Union sent out ads far and wide to tell how superior their cheeses were. A 1985 Chicago Tribune story says the following. You can buy a whole cheese wheel or sections of any size, knowing full well that you are getting the genuine thing. It's quality guaranteed by the Swiss government itself and by the alert, expert guardians of the Swiss Cheese Union. As further adherence to their superiority, in each poster and stamp they sold were the words, Switzerland cheese cannot be copied. Enjoy this flavor that can never be copied. A promising slogan to consumers and an underhanded threat to upcoming cheesemakers. When the Swiss Cheese Union came to power, there came quality control so draconian and so prejudiced, it led to the first and only cheese genocide. Switzerland, what was once the land of a thousand cheeses, hard and soft, blue and fresh, bloomy and washed, were barred from selling their products. Of the thousands of cheeses, the Union fully accepted the sale of only seven, the big ones being Emmental and Gruyere. It was in an NPR episode about the Swiss Cheese Union 
that they met with a man named Seth Barmettler, who gave great insight into those who rejected and then rebelled against the Union. This, this right here, this was the problem. Sepp wasn't into making the really big popular cheeses. At the time, he wanted to make Sprinz. Sprinz mach. Yeah, it was his favorite to, to produce it. I like Sprinz forever. <laughs> but this was not for the cheese rebel to decide. Only the Swiss Cheese Union was allowed to make the decision about who made what in Switzerland. A large part of the country was now producing just those two classic cheeses, Emmental and Gruyere. Sprinz was allowed, but Sepp had to apply to the Swiss Cheese Union in Bern for a license to make the cheese. And it took about eight years until he received final um, information for them. Eight years? Yes, eight years. Eight years of applications and appeals, and the answer from the Swiss Cheese Union was no. You cannot make Sprinz. You can't sell it, you can't export it. Why exactly? It's hard to know. In the letter, they said only, quote, you do not fit into the envisaged structures. They say, uh, you are too, too little. I, I, I'm too, too, too small, huh? It's worth noting here that Switzerland is, and was at the time, a modern liberal democracy. But if you wanted to make sprints, then you had to apply for eight years, and you had to accept no for an answer. That is the power of a cartel. Now the question is, why didn't anyone speak out? Why did anyone appeal to the government? Well, there are two answers. The first was that the union had the government officials in their pocket. When the government began subsidizing the union, it became indefinite because politicians were now tied to subsidizing it in exchange for economic protection. The union's huge sums of money made for easy negotiation. The second was that the Swiss cheese union made themselves look like it was the defender of Swiss culture. In the same NPR episode, Dominic Flammer, a food historian, talks about his first run-in with former cheese union members after publishing one of his works. I was attacked by uh, old members of the Swiss Cheese Union because I criticized them. But you know, this is... Uh, Wait, what did they say to you? They said I'm not patriotic enough to, to write about Swiss cheese and uh, that I would not be allowed to, to tell this story because I would not help the Swiss cheese makers. But in the end, it's accepted today that I wrote the truth and nothing but the truth. So combining draconian control of products with state-backed intimidation makes the cheese cabal less of a union, but something more relatably sinister. What I'm getting at is that this cheese genocide does explain why the most iconic fondues we're familiar with are either Gruyere or Emmental, especially at the height of the Swiss Cheese Union's power in the 70s. But that power would not last for long. By the 90s, Switzerland's economy had diversified. Engineering, medicine, and science became more popular, markets that the Swiss Cheese Union could not compete. As more profitable markets began opening up, the more people saw the union as a liability. Why should our tax money go to subsidizing this one industry, they asked themselves. But their fate would come sooner than later, as in 1996, they were caught red-handed. It was found that from 1988 to 1995, the Swiss Cheese Union intentionally mislabeled processed cheese and sold it to Italy as their more expensive approved cheese, so they can sell it at a lower tax rate. On word of these allegations, the Swiss Cheese Union's Minister of Propaganda was sent to jail. In that same year, the World Trade Organization began investigating. It was announced that this was a violation of international trade laws, charges that placed the Swiss Cheese Union under serious scrutiny. What followed was back-and-forth proceedings of the World Trade Organization finding more bones in the Union's closet, and the Swiss national representatives trying to excuse the seriousness of the practices. In a 1996 press release, the final blow would come when the World Trade Organization said the following. Members remarked on the practices of cartel arrangements in the Swiss economy, frequently the form of vertically integrated concerns, often with exclusive links to suppliers abroad. 
Such practices reduce imports from the level that could be expected under competitive conditions and had detrimental effects on prices." End quote. The Swiss government had no further excuses and conceded to the WTO, leaving the Union stranded without their subsidies. So, in an effort to save themselves, in 1996, the Swiss Cheese Union officially dissolved. After 85 years, the Union, like their golden child, has finally melted away. Today, those who are asked about their involvement in the Swiss Cheese Union are quick to deny their involvement with them. A similar response when asked about the Mafia. Companies that were affiliated with them have mixed feelings about it all. Some say their companies downsized now that they were left to compete in the market, while others like Barmedler were now free to produce and sell their cheeses. But all can agree that after the Swiss Cheese Union, cheese was finally free to branch out into countless new types and brands. It's amazing, he says. There has been an explosion of new cheeses from Switzerland. We have now available to us some really cool stuff other than Gruyere and Emmental, you know, which are your everyday, absolutely important cheeses. But this stuff is beautiful, sexy, delicious, not something you're going to see everywhere. Looking back now, I never thought Fondue's story would be so entwined with an all-powerful cartel. But I think it was worth adding, because it was the Swiss Cheese Union that created the fondue narrative we follow today. It's a testament to how those who own the means of production can control the narrative, and how impactful it is across people and time. But with the union gone, what can we say about fondue? Firstly, I would say is that it's immature to throw the baby out with the bathwater. After all, the union did not invent fondue. They popularized it. And as someone who enjoys eating and serving it, I can say its powers of harmonizing people around it are true. Anytime I serve fondue to my friends or colleagues, it has the power to end all discord as they congregate around the fondue pot. It's almost magical in how that works. But with great scrumptiousness comes great responsibility. With there being no cheese cartel, there is now a whole plethora of recipes to experiment. For starters, I recommend the Everything Fondue Cookbook by Rhonda Parkinson. It has recipes ranging from chocolates to cheeses and even dippers. There's even the classical Gruyere fondue and Trobolone fondue for old schoolers, and more nuanced recipes like pizza fondue and the decadent s'more fondue. As I said, food is an aggregate for bringing people together. And I would say fondue is one of the best ones out there. It's a bonding agent that makes for your with more interactive and engaging. So the next time you're thinking of how to best have fun and friends or females in one sitting, consider the delectable, the creative, and collective power of fondue.